With extraordinary quarantine and control measures, the rate of COVID-19 infections and death in China has been declining over the past weeks. While these efforts have won the world valuable time to prepare for a likely pandemic, many Chinese, especially those living in Wuhan, continue to suffer psychologically. How much impact does the coronavirus outbreak have on people's mental health? And what remedies are available? What the psychology behind panic buying and widespread conspiracy theories? And as big data and AI join the battle against coronavirus, how will tech companies transform the healthcare industry? To talk about these issues and more, in the first half of the show, I'm joined by Professor Han Buxin, president of the Chinese Psychological Society, Dr. Judy Kerensky, professor of psychology at Columbia University Teachers College in New York, and her student, Long Jiawen. In the second half, we'll be joined by Steve Lee, vice dean of Tencent Research Institute, and Professor Benjamin Chow, academic dean at Paris School of Business. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yuan. So let me start with you, uh, Dr. Kerensky. Uh, of course, uh, the COVID-19 has cost the Chinese people a lot, but uh, we haven't been talking a lot about the psychological toll on the people in Wuhan uh, who have been treated uh, with the process of the COVID-19 uh, diagnostic and therapeutic processes, and also those people living in isolation because of the quarantine. You are a professor of psychology. You've been to many uh, disaster-stricken areas in Sichuan Wenchuan earthquake and the uh, SARS outbreak in Hong Kong. What do you think might be the biggest psychological problems for those people? Oh, there are such a range of psychological problems. I'm so glad you're doing this program because we spend a lot of time talking about the masks and talking about how to help yourself medically and washing hands and all of these things. But people's emotions are very high and they go through a wave, first of panic and shock, then a lot of depression and anger, and finally trying to get back to normal what's happening a bit in China now as the kids go back to school and people go back to work. This is a very positive thing. That's part of the scale and the phases. But as you said, mm. the emotions are important and they last a long time. Those are a lot of sadness about what's going on, a lot of fear about could this happen again, and this upset about stig being stigmatized. All of these things are what I found in my students here in America. Because when they came back from spring holiday and they were back in school, as a professor, I had many Chinese students, and they were very upset with sleeplessness and mm. crying and worrying about their family at home. And this is still going on, especially since we now have COVID-19 in New York, in where Columbia University teaches is, and in America. Uh, and so Jowen, uh, my, my Jowen, where are you from and how are your family and friends hanging back in China? Uh, I'm from Chengdu, and I was in Chengdu during the winter break. Uh, my family is doing okay right now. They are gradually going back to work. And But uh, when I was in Chengdu in the winter break, uh, I experienced uh, the lockdown of Wuhan, the news, all the uh, like changes in my life, and there's no one on the street, people wearing masks. So I feel a lot of anxiety during that time. Even when I went back to New York, I still feel that so concerned about what is happening in China. And I cried every day after that, sawing those tragic news. And, uh, how how so did you do with, the, with this negative emotions? Uh, what is your method? Uh, I, we got a lot of uh, support emails from the Teachers College, Columbia University. So I went to uh, Columbia House for a counseling session, psychological counseling session. And after that session, I, I feel much better to process every, everything I went through and to process my emotions, uh, acceptance, the uh, sadness, and the gradually I become better. And Judy, what, yes, and what are the appropriate ways for those people back in Wuhan who are basically living in a lockdown city to cope with those emotions, like you mentioned, depression, anxiety, uh, those things? 
Right, and self-blame and recognizing the problems that children have as well. Uh, sleeplessness, headaches, and stomach aches. It's a somatization, we call it, when they can't express their feelings so much to say, Mommy, I, you know, I, I feel better, I'm sad, or I'm depressed, or what's going to happen is that they really develop those physical symptoms. Or they may not want to go back to school out of fear of what is going on, what may happen to their parents. It's called school phobia. And the second part of that would be fear of catching something again from the other students. Mm -hmm. So I think that what's important for everyone is to recognize your feelings are natural and normal. People get very ashamed of feeling something, like I feel bad, I feel sad, like Joanne said, I'm crying. She cried a lot of the students and she's still been crying. I know she's open about that and shares that with me. And to say, those feelings are okay. I know it's going to take a long time for me to get over this. It's going to be what we call a new normal. Mm. Not just normal, because things have changed, but a, what we call a new normal. And then the more you get back into your routine, the better it is. The other thing that I know I can share, because I spoke a lot of times with um, Jai Wen's mother, because I think it's important to get families back together, which they were when they were isolated. And so one of the things is to, what can I do to take care of myself? What makes me feel happy? What makes me feel like I enjoy my life? You're allowed to have a little bit of joy, even though there's so much pain going on. But so it's very hard for, mother, for people for example, to feel joyful and happy reading. at this moment when their life has been turned upside down. What is your techniques and approaches can make people realize that I this is not the end of the world? I Yes, the end of the world, the apocalypse, they call it, right? And that was the same feeling even in the earthquakes in Sichuan and in Yushu. So the idea is to some recognize that one thought at one moment is what's in your mind. It's kind of like an ancient Chinese thinking, actually, and Confucius thinking that life can be good. <laughs> and the idea is that you're allowed to have joy. See, many times people think many horrible things are going on with this coronavirus in China. I'm not allowed to feel okay. I have to be upset. No, you're allowed to feel joy. So one of the techniques that we do, this is called resilience. This is a very important word, and Chinese people are being very resilient right now. Mm -hmm. I really honor them for that. And one of the techniques that we use for resilience is the simple ball. Mm -hmm. This is called the resilience ball. You bounce back from the problem, which is what Chinese people are doing now. Okay, it was a terrible thing now, we're going through a phase, things are getting a little bit better, getting a little bit under control. Bounce the ball and see, you know what? The ball comes back. Every kid does a bouncing ball, it comes back. I am like this bouncing ball. Mm -hmm. I go through a problem, I'm down here, and I come back up. You are I saying bounce by bouncing back. the ball, Recognize. people have different perceptions of the problems they've encountered in life? You think about, these are my problems here. I'm going to bounce it down, and that's me, down here, feeling awful. But, guess what? I come back up. I can get back to normal. I can get back to my self that does not feel so stressed. Mm. That's one major technique about it. And another technique we use with children Jai Wen would show this here, she did this with the children, is they make pillows. You, well, you could describe this. Yeah, Jai Wen, uh, yes, what is about the, the pillow? Making pi um, by making the pillows, like children are feel they are creating something, the joy, and uh, sharing the, the time with their family, with their teachers, with their uh, friends. Uh, well, they who can made those pillows like, in the first place? Uh, um, I did a work, I did a psychological uh, social psychological support workshop in Chengdu in January this year. So the students, uh, the children from age eight to twelve, they make these pillows uh, right before the coronavirus uh, broke. Okay, so this is a, a way of contact comfort. This is another psychological principle. It's like a teddy bear or anything that children have that they can hold and mm. that they could feel cozy with and, and hold. Another technique I'll show you really quickly is a bridge technique. And what you do is you, you draw. Adults do this too. I, w I did this with adults in China as mm. well. That you draw the sad picture on one side. This is the sadness. This is the crying from the coronavirus and the cloud you could see. 
Then you draw a happy picture over here, and you could see the sun and the family and the heart. And this is a bridge. So anybody could do this at home with their children. And even even adults. adults. I've done it with adults. Yes. So you draw the sad picture, coronavirus over here. Think about something happy. And this is just being drawn by a happy face and a sun and the bridge. And you go from the sad through the bridge to the happy feeling. How do you do mm. that? You do that through thought, thought stopping. All you have to do is to say, for this minute, I'm going to snap my fingers, change my thought. Everybody in every culture, no matter what it is, this is the simplest thing to do. You, can, you are able to go but, from a but sad But in the end, human beings are still social animals. They need to be hanging with other people to feel uh, uh, we are living in this world together. And that, the problem is, uh, because of the quarantine and social <laughs> distancing, we have to keep a distance from each other and away from those social activities. That is a huge difference uh, the COVID-19 has made in this world. Yes, isolation. Everybody just needs to recognize, guess what? It, see, the principle in psychology is that if you accept the feeling and you understand the feeling, you feel better about it. So just what you brilliantly said right there is relevant to say, I'm, I am a social being, and you're totally right. I mean, China families are very important, and, and also the whole the research in psychology shows that the way to get over crisis is by bonding with other people, is when you call your friends, you go out to dinner, you do something together. So you're right about that. Mm -hmm. So you have to say to yourself, this is a time when I'm alone. What can I do to feel okay about being alone? So do something that is a hobby for you. For, as I was starting to say, for, for Jai Wen's mother, she was reading, she was playing a musical instrument. What can, those are the things that mm. make you feel, I'm okay by myself. I'm all right alone. And when I have the chance to be with other people, I will, that will be fine. But right now, what can I do to make yeah. me feel better? It's called self-care. What do you do to make you feel better by yourself? Yes, indeed. Be positive and make the most of, of the current situation. And now we have Professor Han Buxin, yes. president of the Chinese Psychological Society mm -hmm. on the line. So, Mr. Han, China's uh, decision to put Wuhan into lockdown obviously helped limit the global spread, but as Bruce Awood, a head of the WHO team, who said that the world is in your debt, the people of Wuhan have gone through an extraordinary period, and they are going to go through it uh, from for some, quite some time uh, down the road. From a psychological perspective, how would you access the trauma that has, that has been uh, exerted on the people living in Wuhan? And have you made some investigation on the psychological conditions of the people there? Uh, it seems that we have lost Professor Han there. Yes. Yes? Uh, the conclusion uh, are not Correspondent with each other from different investigations. But um, one of my colleagues has a um, um, conclusion that um, people in Wuhan are not actually as so much anxious as the people outside of Wuhan. Uh, they call it the psychological typhoon eye. It means that um, in a typhoon eye, I mean, here, if in Wuhan city inhabitants, they are not so um, anxious as when guess or expected. Mm. Um, people, for example, living in Beijing, they have a, a much higher in anxious, uh, level of anxious or anxiety compared with those uh, Wuhan inhabitants. Uh, do we have a, a so systematic a intervention plan for those people living in uh, Wuhan and elsewhere? Uh, because I know there are telephone hotlines established in different cities uh, when people are seeking for help about their mental health. Yes, of course. Uh, actually, from the first day, uh, it means that uh, uh, 24th of January, uh, colleagues in the uh, registration system of clinical psychology uh, of Chinese Psychological Society have been working, planning for the uh, the psychological support to different groups, especially for clinical doctor, medical doctors or nurses, all those uh, uh, patients have been isolated. 
in uh, our hospital. Um, the, uh, the working has been, working system has been um, developed at this uh, first point, then uh, keep working in collaboration with other uh, departments, for example, in hospital administration, uh, and also with um, psychiatrists, uh -huh. colleagues. And Judy, I have this question for you. Uh, I know that Americans are also beginning to worry about the spread. Uh, the threat is becoming a pandemic uh, in a way and has sparked the people to have panic hoarding of different stuff, face masks, food, and even toilet paper. Uh, what do you make of the mental state of the Americans right now uh, who are facing the threat of the new virus? Well, um, so yeah, I see that Americans, we in New York now that we have a case and certainly through our country, our media is filled with discussion about the coronavirus. Uh, almost every day it's outdone even the fact that we're going through this, um, these political elections and voting. So I think what's important for us is to also recognize what the people in Wuhan have had to recognize because the big word now for us is are we panicking in America? We've panicked before about things. We even have the stock market panic about mm -hmm. the dropping um, stock market. So what everybody's trying to psychologically give the advice is please don't panic. Do what you need to do to protect yourself, but don't walk around thinking that, oh, this per I'm going to get it from this person or I'm going to get it from that person. Be always calm about things. But, but it is easy said okay, than done because I'm, panic do spread. I'm, A lot of people just got panic mode because this is an infectious thing. Well, exactly, but it's not as infectious as many other colds are. And you're right, people are dying, but not as much as from dying other things. So if you panicked, then you need to take a deep breath and even say, I'm panicked about something, and do some breathing, breathing in and breathing out to relax, take a bath if that's what you do, change your brain, distract yourself mm -hmm. by doing distract something that, that helped somebody else. Right, because panic is an emotion that happens at a second. I'm telling you, you can't have two emotions at the same time. So as soon as you feel that panic, you must take a deep breath because panic gets you all worked up like mm -hmm. this. And then you have to change what you're doing, doing something that is enjoyable, helping somebody else, talking to a friend, whether it's on the phone or on the internet through some way, and getting busy mm -hmm. doing what you do uh, and getting back to And I heard life. meditation that helps to you have a better perspective of the problems you face. Well, what is meditation? Meditation is very, because it's a big buzzword, okay? So meditation simply means I'm going to sit calmly like this. I'm panicked, okay? My body is going up. I'm just going to breathe in, and then I'm going to breathe out deeply. Then I'm going to sit very still. I'm going to try to clear my mind first by saying, okay, first I'm thinking about the coronavirus. I'm thinking about how I'm going to get sick. I'm breathing in. I'm breathing out. And now I'm going to change my mind to thinking about what was the happiest thing that happened to me last week? What, mm. did I, what did my child do that made me happy? What, what do I enjoy doing? Ah, let me go play my guitar. Let me go read that book I like. Mm. Let me go take a bath. Let me go do something that I enjoy doing. That is the way to deal with panic. Okay. Thank you very much, Judy and Jalen. Of course, we have to have some happy moments, even in this difficult time. Thank you. We'll take a short break and be right back. Welcome back. Well, big data and AI, those technologies are also helping in combating the coronavirus outbreak. Now I'm joined by Steve Lee, Vice Dean of Tencent Research Institute in Beijing and Professor Benjamin Chow, Ac Academic Dean of the Paris School of Business and Honorary Academic Chair of the Shenzhen Industry Association of AI in Cambridge. Let me start with you, Steve. Uh, we know that the WHO joined uh, expert team recently visited Tencent during their inspection in China. What can you tell us about Tencent's technologies being adopted to contain the coronavirus epidemic? Well, it was a great pleasure to host experts from WHO in our Shenzhen headquarters. Uh, let me give you some examples of what we shared with our experts. 
uh, from the WHO. Uh, first example would be the, uh, the healthcare research teams in Tianjin have quickly developed an algorithm to detect risky cases of COVID-19 based on CT scan images mm -hmm. in about 10 days. They have transformed this algorithm into a built-in component for the scanning machine and shifted these machines to the epic center of this outbreak. As for today, there are, or, uh, there are about seven such machines working in hospitals in Wuhan. Uh, another example would be the applications uh, that help the students and workers study and work from home. Uh, Tencent online study platforms cooperate with the local authorities and help about 730,000 students from Wuhan to study from home. It's basically like uh, the teachers can open a uh, online class uh, in our platforms and invite all his students in, live broadcast its uh, teaching content and have some real-time interactions with their uh, students. And, 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 and Steve, about the uh, CT scan reading, uh, how widespread that technology is being used in hospitals in Wuhan and by how much it increased the efficiency of reading of those images? Uh, it's still, uh, uh, from what I know, they, uh, those these scan machines have been located in uh, about seven. There are, uh, there are a total number of seven such machines okay. in the hospitals in Wuhan. And it's still kind of uh, too early to tell how much uh, this uh, CD scan uh, machines can help uh, the uh, doctors in the hospitals to uh, for, because all these uh, uh, evaluations of the efficiencies of these algorithms uh -huh. will be based on uh, ritual data that means we are still collecting data to verify if this uh, are really uh, helping the doctors and I know it's like uh, companies like Tencent and Alibaba have also been uh, working with local governments to have a color based QR code system uh, with ratings as uh, red yellow and green telling each and everybody uh, how risky uh, or in terms of infectiousness is and the QR code system assesses individuals uh, on, uh, based on their health information and travel history. Can you explain to us how it works? Uh, this, uh, this is uh, from what I know uh, uh, just uh, roughly explain how this uh, system works. Uh, it's like uh, the individuals actually registered uh, on the platform of, uh, provided by the National Public Service. And uh, after the registration, the individual can self-report uh, uh, its uh, his or her uh, late status, such as their body temperature, uh, where have they been, uh, have they been to hospitals or other risky places, have they left their residential city uh, to in the past few weeks. And all this data will then be reported to the local government okay. and will be double checked uh, with uh, the uh, data set that accumulated uh, by the local government to see if they are telling the truth. And then, uh, based on uh, these information collected, a uh, color code will be distributed. Uh, some, uh, if it's green, that means you're clear, uh, and if it's red, that means you better stay at home and quarantine, quarantine yourself. Hmm. And what we found is sometimes an individual may not know, may not recognize that uh, he or she should be confined based on the uh, local policies. Uh, for example, one of my colleagues uh, just uh, came back from uh, came back from her hometown in Jiangxi province about two weeks ago, and it's only in this morning that his coat has turned from red to green, and she was allowed. And all cleared and she came, uh, came to the office to work. So the information uh, is updated uh, on a daily basis, probably right. an hourly basis. And, right. ben and Benjamin, uh, what is your take? You are a watcher of technology and economy in China and what are your assessment of technologies being used in this uh, containment of the new virus? Well, I've been uh, in Europe and China for the last two months so I'm witnessing uh, different ways, different governments are, are dealing with the virus. I think China really has uh, some uh, well record in some of these new implementations. I think conceptually, uh, the good old way of isolation and identification is the way to go for uh, containing a virus. And, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, right now, the, some of these firms in China are able to even uh, use your uh, GPS location tracking uh, to supplement 
for example, the health group that you just mentioned, to see if people are really truly reporting uh, their travel history. Uh, in addition to the uh, other health history uh, the student might have, which the government provides, then the a, a code will be generated so that the uh, patient, uh, the, the pa person, can enter or exit the building. So this is a, a big help. Uh, for some other more hidden uh, uh, outbreaks, uh, the, uh, some of these internet firms are able to track surges in uh, flu medicine demands mm. so that it would uh, alert the government of uh, anything that, it, that could happen uh, which has not been reported. I think uh, this sort of big data really helps uh, reduce information asymmetry. I think Tencent especially is making a, a great contribution because uh, any under reporting by the local government uh, is deemed to, you know, uh, it's very easy to be reviewed because any a typical person can uh, uh, post information, unusual information online and there are platforms enabled by WeChat, sometimes Alibaba, to, uh, to report directly, bypassing the local okay. government to the central but, government. But, but of Steve, what, of what about people's yes. concern about their data security and user privacy? Because that means Tencent knows where I have been, what I've bought, and they've been, this data has been used by your company and the local government to track their movement. Uh, I think this, uh, this, th there are some misunderstandings and misperceptions uh, about uh, how we use data. Actually, uh, a, a better uh, comparison, a better uh, example, a better way to uh, illustrate this relationship is, is like uh, a Tencent is working like a, a third party contractors mm. to the local government. And uh, we, because uh, we have the technological solutions and we have this uh, entrance of all the traffic on the internet, so that it's easier for the uh, government to, uh, help, to work with us to come up with some, something that uh, needs to reach to a wide public and uh, need to be real uh, in time. And uh, uh, that's uh, uh, for those data, most of those data, as I just said, was collected based on the self-reported uh, data. Okay. And all so they voluntarily data. update their own information to you. Right. And for all these app, uh, super apps uh, like uh, WeChat, like Alipay, actually uh, on, on your phone, if you switch off to other apps, we cannot okay. actually locate you. This is uh, automatically switched off. And uh, for all these uh, informations, uh, the, the, especially the location information, you can actually uh, pick up uh, and to close okay. all these uh, details. I have to cut you off yeah, there. Right. We are running out okay, of time. Sure. I hope I have more time. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Benjamin. You've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Zoe in Beijing. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.